Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the college admissions process podcast. I am your host, John Durante. And I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insights straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions, regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given podcast episode You should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, everyone, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your proud host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure today to introduce you to Ian Schachner, who is the Senior Associate Director of Admissions at Cornell University. Ian, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate it. And how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for the invitation, John. My pleasure. And again, we can't thank you enough for uh, being here today and giving up your time. So Ian, why don't we start by asking you to just tell us about yourself. How long have you been in admissions and how did you end up in this position? Sure. Um, so so I've been in admissions for uh, over 16 years now, about 16 and a half years. Um, I, I wound up uh, going to graduate school at Cornell, specifically for the school that I currently work for, the Industrial and Labor Relations School. So our school studies work. Um, and I actually went there to study the people side of organizations. I went there to study group dynamics, leadership, um, what makes any organization incredibly successful and ethical and standing for the right things, and then what leads them in the opposite direction. Um, so it was a lot of organizational behavior. Um, it was a lot of human resource management. Um, and really what I wound up finding was uh, I loved that notion of how the people make a place, right? The people who are recruited, the people who are selected, the the culture of the place. And that's kind of how I wound up in admissions is, is admissions, I realized, is kind of the HR of academia. Um, I became, I loved my experience in there and I became very defensive of Cornell. Um, and I said, oh, I'd like to play a role in uh, making sure people, people like me who really appreciate the place um, and work hard to get there um, can get there. Well, that's fantastic. And I love the reference to HR of academia. That's terrific. I've never heard that, but it's so true. So I really appreciate it. Now, I'm going to ask an obvious question because Cornell University is known throughout the world as one of the top universities um, that that exists. Obviously, it's one of the Ivy Leagues. But Ian, let me ask you, what is it about Cornell University that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately spend at least four years there? So big question, right? Um, I, anytime I hear a question like that, I, I do have to I encourage everyone to kind of step back and say that this process is really about them as an individual. So I can, I can give you a response of, Oh, this is what I think is great about the university. But when I do any types of admissions counseling, I always start off by emphasizing, you know, the onus is on the student to decide that. Is it appealing to me? Is this the right place for me? Um, so I'll, here's some things that I think are great about it. At the same time, this process is really about people learning about themselves, um, what they want out of college, what kind of environment that they want to be in. So I love it. I think it's great for a lot of people. Might not be right for everyone. No school is. So I always have to start there. Um, what do I think is great about it? I, uh, to, to me, what I think 
is best about it. What uh, One of the things I'm most passionate about, about education specifically at the college level, is that uh, if college does its job well, one of the things that people should take away from it is just how much different fields are connected. You know, maybe sometimes when people do a search, they go, oh, look at this major, and maybe that one's more important than this one. And and I even see it play out in certain pre-professional programs, right? Like in a business school, sometimes you'll have oh, the finance people and we think we're a little more important than the marketing people. You know, you see that hierarchy in, in searches for for majors and colleges and all that. But but I really do think if college does its, its job, it helps you realize um, just how important every field is and how connected different things can be. And that to me is something Cornell does an incredible job at. I, just to use an example, you can, you can be in something that is uh, uh, the liberal arts part of Cornell. You can be in engineering, you can be in uh, the specific school I work for, industrial and labor relations, but every curriculum really encourages you to go use the rest of the school. And the openness of, you know, we say, oh, there's a thousand clubs, but it's the openness of clubs and the way that we promote, like, I don't care what your major is. Go listen to someone lecture about philosophy. Go to a poetry reading. Go sit in on a presentation where a professor and a student are are talking about nanotechnology, even if you don't understand it. And, and I think... I think promoting that and really getting people to understand just how connected fields are, um, to me, is probably the best part of it. I think we do a I think we do a really good job of that. Well, you certainly do a great job on it, and I'm really impressed with that answer because you talked about the connectedness, right? You didn't just talk about, like you said, over a thousand clubs and academic majors. We all know that there's a long list of each for Cornell University. But just the idea of going to sit in on a philosophy professor's lecture, going to sit in on a lecture on nanotechnology, these are things that most people are not going to have the opportunity to do once they leave college. And so I just want to thank you. I think that's a great perspective, a great answer on the question of why it makes it so appealing. And so it sounds like that's something that is fostered you know, in terms of how connected we are, but making connections not only within your own major, but other majors that Cornell University has to offer. Am I right? You are. And I, and I will say it also drives how um, a lot of our advice, a lot of times when we speak with students, we speak, oh, what formal clubs can I do? What research can I get involved in? It's great. It's it, That can be a part of the college experience for people. Um, but I and some other fellow advisors, I know when we spoke, speak to students, we we often say to them, also, plan in time for completely unaffiliated things. Not everything has to be um, work, a, a job, a, a, a pre-law society or something like that. You know, we from the very beginning when people arrive, we always encourage them. You'll forget this several times throughout your time here, but every <laughs> so often, you know, every Sunday, just go check the general events list, the general Cornell events list. Right. Right. And just go check it out. Go, go, go to the Friday night, uh, just open free uh, astronomy presentations where they give you access to the telescopes, you know, go, go take a free photography class in the Arboretum, uh, learning about nature photography. So. Well, that's a great answer. I really appreciate that. So let me ask you, Ian, how many applications do you actually review a year and do you represent a specific region? Sure. So, so the way it works at Cornell um, is Cornell is made up of its separate colleges and schools. Um, you, for those listening, looking at colleges, right, probably one of the most important things, and I will emphasize this over and over, it is very important to understand the structure of the programs that you're applying to. Some colleges or universities, you apply and you pick a major. Right. Some you right. Some you may apply to a particular college or school, and that place is like your whole life. Others, it's like us at Cornell. Um, you apply to Cornell, but you select one of the colleges or schools to apply to, and that is your home base for going throughout all of Cornell. 
Um, I work specifically for one of the smaller schools, the Industrial and Labor Relations School. So we only have about a thousand undergraduates. Um, so between our freshman applications, um, we also get a good number of transfer applications. I read anywhere between mm, 1,500 to 2,000 applications a year. Wow. So definitely kind of a smaller group relative to, say, my colleagues in arts who get thousands and thousands of applications. Oh, and so to your point, I um, question, um, no, we're in my school, we, we're not separated by region. Um, as one of the smaller schools, um, we have a volume and staffing such that we don't have to separate it like West Coast, East Coast or anything like that. Terrific. And thank you so much for that insight. I would imagine that most students, Ian, applying to Cornell University have a solid A plus average while taking some of the most rigorous courses their high schools have to offer and having immersed themselves in so much of what their schools offer outside of the classroom as well. Yeah. So with more applicants that are worthy than seats available for admission, can you walk us through the process? What items are you looking at to evaluate a candidate? And how do you make your final decision, again, with so many viable candidates yeah. and not enough seats to fill or to give to each one of those candidates? It's a great question. Uh, I do have to, in, you know, in a case like this, I would emphasize I am, I am speaking mainly for, for mostly for my particular school and process. I do know that I can speak for a large part of Cornell in terms of uh, emphasizing certain, certain things like fit, which I'll talk, but I just mentioned, just, I, I just point that out. Because since you apply to a particular college or school at Cornell, it's just going to their admissions committee, right? If you apply to the College of Engineering, their committee is reviewing your application. Um, ILR, my school, I'm saying it. So there are definitely some key themes amongst all of them, but I, but anytime any of us from Cornell present, we always have to drive home but at the end of the day, for the most specific advice possible, get in touch with the admission staff from your targeted school. The best example of that would be um, there's the architecture, art, and planning uh, college. Okay. They require a portfolio, right? And they require right. a portfolio right. interview, like a lot of schools like that. So, so their process in terms of what they emphasize, that has, you know, that that's something that has no role in every other school that right. you're applying to here, but there it plays an enormous role in things. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so walking you through the process, I guess, in terms of key things, uh, what I will say is first I go to the transcript. Most of my colleagues go to the transcript. It's not, we don't go to the transcript for the reasons people think we, uh, we, it, it, this is not to see, did you get an A plus in everything you've taken since the seventh grade? <laughs> Really, the first thing that I know a lot of us do is just to see if you can do the work. I know that sounds vague, but if you think um, there is no magical collection of a record that says you can do the work. Uh, for example, sometimes, uh, sometimes, oh God, this the last few years are a great example of it. If someone dipped a bit in their sophomore year because it turned out there was a plague. <laughs> uh, all right. You know, what are we going to, what are we going to do? We're not going to tear it in some cold way that goes, but this person got a, an A plus and everything. So context always matters when we, when we're looking at an academic record. So mainly we're looking at the record first to see, and for those, uh, for those schools um, that still look at things like SATs, yeah, or ACTs, that can play a role. You're looking at the overall academic record to go, is it even responsible to bring this person here? T to use my program as an example, we're a very reading and writing intensive program. We're an interdisciplinary program, mainly focused on the social sciences. If I look at someone's record and I see some blips in the hard sciences and they are crushing the social sciences, I, we're not knocking that person out of the pool. They can do the work. So that that's, I just want to emphasize, that's really what we look for. The, the other thing to, to note about transcripts and all that, because people think we, people think that makes or breaks the whole application is, did they follow the guidelines? 
Uh, if we have, say, for something like the College of Engineering or uh, any of these pre-med programs, if on their website they have very specific math requirements, science requirements, it's really important to take those or just to show you did your research, right? So, for example, um, if your school didn't offer it, if you weren't able to take it for some reason, just showing this isn't another college. I'm click and send on the common application. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm doing my due diligence. Um, writing in the application, I understand that you that you uh, uh, your requirements said up to this level. Please note this was not available at my school. I am signing up for the summer. That stuff. That stuff matters. So first thing, just the transcripts. And I will tell you, uh, the majority of my colleagues, we go right on to the essays. If, if we, I mean, we, we always do a full read, but if we see you can do the work, we go right on to those essays. And to my earlier point that it's in our structure, because you have to commit it to a particular school, those essays can make or break the application. In particular, what I'm referencing is Cornell has two essays. I'm, I'm mainly referring to the Cornell supplement, the one where you write about the particular college and school you're applying to um, or the major. That is the one that I would honestly say carries uh, the most weight of anything. We really need to see that it's just not a copy paste um, from another college. Um, if there are, if there is some overlap, say at, a, at our university, and you see, this is, this is a good example of, I think, general college advice. If you're applying to a university or a college that may have two majors that seem somewhat similar, take a different approach to a topic, but you have to get admitted to a particular major or college, you really need to show that you understand the difference between those programs. Um, so, so so yeah, that's what we go to next. And the rest, you know, we could talk a little bit more about, yes, we look at references, activities. That it, it does matter. You did ask about if everyone has this long list of activities. The one, my last comment here about that will be, everyone doesn't have to have the same background. They don't have to say, have the same exhaustive list. Um, for example, we're far more interested in why you've done what you've done than having some exhaustive list or being the leader or captain of five different things. So making sure you can do the work, showing you've done your research to fulfill the requirements of that program, and whether it's through your activities or what you have to say in the essay, showing that you are a solid fit for the program that has to admit you. Not Cornell in general, not for loving Ithaca, New York, where we're based, <laughs> a particular program that their committee is deciding, that's that's what carries the most weight. That's how we distinguish between a, a very competitive pool. Hey, podcast friends, are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear? Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. As an affiliate partner with Prep Sportswear, the podcast does receive a small commission if you make a purchase. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel that would benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. Such great advice, tremendous insight. And you touched upon a couple of things that I'm going to ask you about. The first being demonstrated interest, which you touched upon, like I said. You also started talking a little bit about essays. So let's unpackage that a little further by first asking you, what are some of the other things that students do to show demonstrated interest? In other words, obviously, if Cornell University is their first choice, what are some of the other things that you've seen them do to make sure that they make that very clear to you? So, so, you know, this is a, this is a, I have some very specific advice here, which is quite frankly, like in this age where so many different things get into systems and databases, the one obvious thing is get in their database, meaning request information, get on their email list, just make sure you don't miss something. Um, that, that can be important. Just, 
just in terms of your own research and your own ability to connect to a program. That that can matter. Um, I, I always have a lot to say. I won't go too much about it, but but establishing fit, as I explained, um, diving into the particular curriculum curriculum you're applying to, showing that you've researched it. Uh, when 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 questions like this get asked, I keep in mind I'm not speaking about other universities and other colleges. I don't know how they look at things like, well, look, if we have to hit our targets, we want to see who took the time to travel here. We want to see you took not just once, but but who spent a summer here taking classes. We, by and large, we don't do that here because to us that 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 can raise an equity issue, right? Who has right. time to travel right. here? Who has the resources? Right. Um, so I know when you know when our committee reads, we we don't think it's fair to look at things. Ooh, this person's more likely to come because they already spent a summer here. Um, that that stuff. It's a, it's a fairness issue with us. So really what I would go back to is if it's your first choice, if you know it's there, show it through connecting to the program. Uh, that, yes, even with schools that say, oh, look how they came, not just for one, they came for an info session and a tour. I am not saying it at many schools that that's an insignificant variable, but I would argue that almost every, for anyone I know in admissions, showing through your research and your writing that that program is your first choice trumps anything else you can do. Well, that's tr tremendous advice. And you keep on mentioning the supplemental essay. And I just want to add that students, it's very important to treat the supplemental essay or essays just like the original essay. I know of a lot of people that spend a lot of that's time right. on the main essay and then they say, oh, this school requires two supplementals. Okay. And they give a short answer. I think it's very important and you've emphasized it, Ian, but I just want to reemphasize it that it's very important to, like you said, not to copy and paste from another college or university into those supplemental questions, but to really dive deep and really explain why it is, in fact, that you want to attend Cornell University and answer each question, the first one, the supplemental ones, with the same amount of passion, if you will. <laughs> Do you agree, Ian? Definitely. I, I think um, at many schools, um, forget everything. If you don't do that, you should not bother applying. That's my two cents. I think it, it doesn't mean that they offer an optional essay or they say, oh, additional information. I don't think, John, you and I are talking about that. Right. Um, we're talking about if a school says, here's how we admit, we admit to a major, we admit to a college or school. I mean, even for, I, to, to speak quite literally about it, right? We're, we're, we want a full class. Right. Right. We of want, course. we want a full class and we want students who are not only going to enter our program, but we're, we really want them to stay there. We're not going to admit you if you can't convince us that you're not only passionate enough to make this a top choice, but it, for uh, to use an example, you can write an entire essay uh, for the supplement, but if it's all about Cornell in general, we're not going to admit you. Because maybe you'll like our program, maybe you won't. But there's too many other students who, who understand they're applying to our particular school or college. Great advice, Ian. I truly appreciate it. Earlier, we talked a little bit about college essays. So let's dig a little deeper. What are some examples of college essays that really stuck out with you? In other words, when you read them, you thought, wow, I really need to meet this candidate. For the purpose of... Um for the purpose of, I'd say, being helpful, being as helpful as possible to anyone who may uh, be watch or listen. Um, I would just say that I, I, I definitely have some examples. I'll throw some out, I, but I will just say, I think the theme of what made them stand out might be even more useful. In other words, um, I, I do think there were some themes to it. What made me say, that's who should be in our classroom. That's who the faculty want us to look for. Um, the best of them, they were things like, a, uh, they were students who did not, who wrote things that made it clear they're not finished yet. 
as a person, as a leader, schools say we want leaders. Um, and I, I always emphasize this, like you're applying to an educational institution. Uh, the whole reason we exist is based on this notion that you're actually not done yet. <laughs> you, you still have a lot to learn. You still have a lot uh, 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 to think about and a lot of ways to grow and all that. And so, and so I mention that because um, I, I'm using that example because one of the things my particular program studies is leadership. Um, and so we do get a lot of people, and I know a lot of colleges get, the, the, get this these days, they get a lot of people who write essays that are kind of just emphasizing, I did, you know, I did this, I did that, then I did this. You should, it's, it should be pretty clear to you that I'm very impressive. They're not wrong. So I, I'm not belittling what the achievements that people write about. It's incredibly impressive. We are so fortunate to get this amazing applicant pool. But your questions were about the essays that stand out, make us like, who do we want in the classroom? Who do we want to run into the hall and have a random hour conversation with? The ones that have stood out are the ones where maybe they, and I'm thinking of a few specific ones, they did achieve something impressive. The essay was about the awful process that led there. The questioning along the way, the screw ups along the way, right. the course right. correcting. Right. And, and to that, and it reminded me of one of my other favorites, um, and it was about a, a student government election. And that's how I became the president of SGA. One of the best ones I ever read was someone who did not, ran an incredible campaign and failed. It was a riveting essay about the judgments you have to make and about. Uh, do the ends justify the means? That made me want to chat. That that was I. That's someone who should be in our classes. So so I hope that gives some guidance. It's it's we don't the best essays that really stand out to me. They're they're about you're applying to an educational institution. Take us into how not that you did something great or that you did anything at all. Take us into your mind. How do you learn? How do you think? Show us how you're going to be thinking about and wrestling with the issues that you're going to, that we're going to be talking to you about here. Um, I'll just end that part by saying like, you know, like I, I yes, I have some examples um, of the, Oh, what stood out? I think sometimes when I'm asked that people want something like, Oh, the, the best one stood out because of creativity, you know, the creative way it was written. And I have some of those, right? There's, there's one I read in one of my first years. Um, uh, uh, a, a young girl wrote something about, she, she was writing about her skills and interest in group dynamics and conflict resolution, but she framed it as a story of why, no, I'm sorry, not why, there was a zombie apocalypse and she survived it. It was kind of like a World War Z thing. This is when the book was really popular. And so she wrote this essay about being in the Girl Scouts and the teams, the sports team she was a part of. And she basically wrote this tale that emphasized why she knew the issues in my school mattered, but through this narrative of, and here's how I survived the zombie apocalypse. Yes, it stood out. That is not, I would, but, but if we're playing a numbers game, that is not how I would advise you to stand out through, through a unique, the, there are more important things to keep in mind about how to stand out in terms of connecting with a program. Does that make sense? It, it absolutely does. And I love what you said earlier in terms of quote unquote, not done yet. I love that, you know, emphasizing that, yes, you've done a lot of great things, but you're not done yet. You have a lot to learn. And maybe it's also recognizing that you're applying to Cornell University, which is obviously something that's larger than all of us, but you want to be a member of that community. And not only do you want to learn, but you want to contribute. You want to give something back and make it, you know, better if you can, yeah. um, as great as it is. So I think that's phenomenal advice, Ian. I truly appreciate it. And I love uh, hearing you speak about it. Let me ask you a similar question, but on the flip side of things in terms of college essays, are there essays that stood out, but in a bad way, or are there things that should just be avoided in writing so, essays? So, so, okay. I mentioned that zombie apocalypse one, right? But here, here's, here's the right. thing. I, 
you know, at the end of the day, when people are asking me for advice, I have to respond like it's the numbers game it is. In other words, um, that I can recall an essay from 11 years ago that someone did a creative narrative and it worked. <laughs> uh, it does not follow that if I ran the numbers, it would show that creativity is the way to do it. So, so I use that as an example because, and, and remember, this is program dependent. Uh, for, th for those people who are applying to say an English major, a writing major, um, literature, it might be different. Right. But if you're asking for my blunt advice on the missions, I, what are some things that stand out in, on the bad side? I, I just, this is my personal slash professional response. I, honestly, I think it's, we speak to people and they go, oh, uh, my counselor or my friend got in with this. They, they said, I should write it in a funny way. I should write it in a unique way, like this unique narrative. Uh, man, humor is tough to pull off. <laughs> it's, and, and, and you got to think about, um, I mean, you think quite literally about this process, right? You're going to a committee, a group of people who have to read, I, I, I'm not telling someone not to take a humorous route. I'm, I'm encouraging you to consider all your options and really think about the best way to achieve your goals. And, and I'm going to give you a horrible reason why. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I've, again, I've been over 16 years. I, I've had phenomenal colleagues. I, I've been in the, the, main, the same office for a really long time, had much of different staff over the years. All great. But man, I have had some years where like I, the people are wonderful, but I have... I have read some essays that were brilliant and so funny. And I, like, I've taken them to a colleague who, who wasn't the assigned reader. I'm like, look at this. And she looked at it and she went, <laughs> she went, that's crazy that that happened to her. And I, I went, it's hysterical. What are you talking about? <laughs> so like, so that's what this, I mean, over the years, this became part of my advice. Like, man, these colleagues are amazing. They're just as passionate higher ed. I wish I could work with them for the rest of their lives. Man, they are just not funny. <laughs> like, they have so many great qualities, but Personally, I was like, man, your sense of humor is off. If you got me, you'd be fine. Right? So like humor can be tough to pull off. Create a creative narrative. An example would be, um, the la real quick example would be, honestly, I, it's so beautiful. I know it comes from the heart. Sometimes people say you have to, you have to present yourself in a genuine way. Right. Right. Yes. But I'm asking you to consider, are there other ways, if you can show it well that way and still accomplish, let's say someone in admission, let's use, let's stick with exactly what we're talking about. You have to convince people of a particular program that you've researched the program and you are passionate about the issues, right? Right. Okay. If you're applying to a labor relations school where we study globalization, human rights, poverty, inequality, applying to College of Engineering, applying to one of these other things. Your application is going to a person, right? And, and one of the pieces of advice I give to people, you, these are marketing packages, right? You have X amount of space to convey certain messages. And you don't, you have to prepare these things like you're not like you're the third they'll read that day. You prepare these like they're the 30th application they're reading that day. So back to your question, what are some bad ones? I'm not saying they were bad, but when I speak to people about applying, I'm speaking realistically about the process you want to successfully go through. And if it's going to me and it's 1.30 in the morning and I'm sitting in College Town Bagels, <laughs> popular place in Ithaca, and I'm on like coffee five and I'm shaking from caffeine and like rethinking all my life choices. <laughs> John, I do not want to have to dive into a poem to figure out what your interests are, right? <laughs> like, I just don't. I just, in the fourth paragraph, after a, a beautiful lead-in, and, like, and it is the 30th one I've read that day. So creativity, humor, um, things like that can work. But you definitely have to use... Uh, your team around you, 
to be a check. Tell them what the goals are. Tell them what messages you have to convey. I, I hope I didn't turn off the more creative people, but my goal isn't, my goal when I advise people is not to get them to write the application that they are absolutely most proud of because it represents them perfectly in every way. My goal is to speak bluntly about the process that you want to successfully navigate. Well, Ian, we appreciate the bluntness because there's a lot of students and parents listening in. So thank you so much for your insight and honesty. We truly appreciate it more than you know. How about teacher letters of recommendation what are you looking for to help get you a better picture of the candidate? Are there any examples of letters that really stuck out and made an impression on you, Ian? Yeah. So, so you know what? I'm glad this is a, the next one because um, I'm going to go back and reference something I said before. It's an application, right? Yeah, whether it's a job application, college grads, right? it's a marketing package. Um, you are learning about the institution. You learn about the types of things that they may be looking for, and you have X amount of space to convey things to them. Uh, you, you're in your in your exploration process. You're trying to learn what those things are, um, and you learn things, right? Like some may say, "Oh, they like people who have passions outside the classroom, and they like people who can handle rigorous curriculums, and they like people with a particular passion for global health." Right? You, those you you learn those things. You have to convey. So when I talk to people about references, what, what I think is most important to note, again, a, a marketing package, I always use that example because marketing isn't about a good use of space. Right? It's about the best use of space. And I say that because when I talk to people about references, um, I do think it's important to note, you have to think about what messages you, you're trying to convey and what those teachers may convey about you. Um, an example would be, uh, the reason I say that is um, for the types of messages you want to convey, and Cornell's a good example, right? We'll go back to this idea that when you pick a college or school, you really got to show your, your fit with that program. Uh, you want to show that you're the type of person, not that, oh, I, I can't wait to use this major or this degree to get me to this job. These applications are, you're trying to convince us you want to be a part of this journey. Not so much that you want this end goal. No, no admissions committee wants to feel like, hey, here's how I want to use you to have a good future in this thing, right? It's it's about that that question of, well, how do I convince these people that who I want to sit around for hours with discussing these issues, that I want to debate these topics, right? And I mention that because I think when you really think about that you'd be surprised about which teachers may be able to provide what would be a strong recommendation. And the example would be, you know, sometimes, sometimes to accomplish your goal, you may not want to default to the teacher uh, who you've had a magical bond with because you've had three classes with them. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's the class that maybe you didn't, maybe it wasn't even your best class, right? But there was one project in it it was the spark. It was the, it was the, maybe you didn't have a magical bond, but you nailed that report, that research project. You went out all out. That's when you realized you were so passionate about the Middle East, about a particular type of law, about uh, uh, sci uh, animal sciences. So a good reference, if we're thinking about it as a marketing package, it's not just, uh, sometimes, sometimes it can even be Sometimes you may not even actually get a good reference if it's just like, Jonathan is amazing. She's the greatest student. Uh, he's the greatest student I ever worked with. Um, everyone at Cornell will love working with him. Sometimes we don't need that personal stuff. We need someone from two years ago who was like, yes, this is what they did with the project. So, so I mentioned that because, look, at the end of the day, you can't tell, you can't tell a reference what to write. But as someone who has to write a lot of references, and I've spoken to a lot of high school teachers, and you may know this, right? It is tough writing references. It's so tough. And you never, you always want to write more than you have time for. And so my, my pitch to students is, look, you can't tell people what to write. But you can help. 
If, if you really think about how you want to present yourself to a school, um, what, what a particular teacher may have to say about a project you worked on, stuff like that, um, a skill that you have, a, a specific story, specific story stand out. You can't tell them what to write, but you can hint at it. If you, if you, if you write to a teacher when you ask them to be a reference and you say, Hey, I was just on uh, the college uh, application process podcast, and here's what the guy <laughs> said. Or I just visited a school, and here's what they said. It that made me think that you'd be an excellent reference because it was the project in your class doing X. What right? You can help. Absolutely, him. absolutely. The last, last, last comment about it because you asked me for an example. Sure. Some uh, some of the best examples of references we get. Uh, going back, remember I mentioned the, uh, an essay. Sometimes they're about failure. Right. <laughs> exactly. I tried this thing and I didn't do well. Some of the best essays are, are from classes where students didn't do any, didn't do well. And they were, they were things like, um, uh, Ian is not a science person. Uh, he knows it. I know it. Uh, all of Lawrence high school is aware of it, <laughs> <laughs> but he came to me after bombing the first test and said, I'm a senior now. It's clear. I don't have a talent in, in the natural sciences. What, what do I do? How do you develop study skills? I want to get better at this, but it's not a natural talent. What do you do? And we did it. It was an amazing reference. Love that. Absolutely love that. And I love that you talk about the package, the marketing package. I think that is so important because students work for four or five years and more to create that transcript that obviously you're going to read. They work on co-curricular activities or clubs, and hopefully some of them grow into leadership roles. But yeah. the teacher letter is something that is so important. And I love that you said the specific story is more important than necessarily having the teacher that you've had for three years in a row. But if you get a teacher to write about that specific story, maybe it's some some project that made you realize how passionate you were about animal science, about law, about philosophy, whatever it is. Yep. I just think that's tremendous advice, Ian. So thank you so much for that explanation. I really appreciate it because I know it's going to help a lot of students and their parents give clarity in terms of what to ask. And so you're right. You can't tell a teacher what to write, but like you said, you could certainly hint to them and say, hey, Remember that time that we did this project and we all laughed because I did X, Y, and Z? Could you write about that? Could you mention that in your letter, right? And I don't think that there's one teacher that I, would say no. <laughs> John, I, I tell students to blame me. Right, right. But please, I told you, it's really important to connect with us in these ways. Tell them that. Right. Tell them I said that. And I, and I appreciate that. And, and again, that is the reason why we're putting these conversations together in this podcast, because we want to give the students the insight. This is a difficult time. It's a, it's, it's a complicated process in terms of yeah. researching which college or university is right for you. But the reason that we have these conversations, again, with the people that ultimately make the decisions here, such as yourself, is because we really want to give the best possible advice to students and their parents and to help make it a more smooth, a more bearable process. Yeah. So Ian, I really can't thank you enough for that. Sure. Every admissions officer receives a copy, obviously of the prospective student's transcript and activity sheet. I would imagine again that every applicant to Cornell is in the top tier of their high school class in terms of grades and activities they participated in, having immersed themselves again in everything their schools have to offer inside the classrooms and beyond. Is there anything specific you are looking for when reviewing these items, Ian? Uh, and are you referring to their overall academic record or? I think we're referring to the whole application, right? As you put it, the marketing package, the clubs, yeah. the leadership roles, their letter, yeah. their suppl supplemental uh, essays, teacher letters of yeah. recommendations, the whole package. So, so I'm, I want to flip this a little bit sure. um, and say sometimes, because I've covered a bit about making sure that the fit is there. Right. Uh, so I want to provide a little more, uh, a, a, a few more examples of ways to go about doing that. Because Please to do. your point, 
We are very lucky. We, we have a very strong competitive applicant pool. But sometimes when people say, well, okay, then how do I stand out even further? Sometimes what jumps to mind for me are the things not to do. Right. Um, and so what I can tell you, and some of this may be uh, general college application advice, but I can tell you for most of my colleagues at Cornell, this really matters a great deal. Um, I, I kind of mentioned it earlier. It's journey, not the end goal. Right. Um, it, if you think you know what you want to do with your life, that's great. And I'm not saying you can never mention it, but do not make it the crux of your application. Right. Um, uh, we do not, we do not, a lot of us, first of all, don't believe you. And it's not because it's you, it's because it's life, <laughs> right? This, we've, we've, we've been in college, we've been here a while. We know what happens. Uh, here is where you explore. Here is where you learn just how complex different fields are, or, or my school, <laughs> my school, industrial and labor relations, we study work, we study the workplace. So there's a joke that we make about our school, which is, uh, if there's any one lesson you should take away from our school, is that it is so unbelievably difficult to actually know what someone does for a living. It's so complex. It's not like, I did a summer of it. And I spoke to my mom a lot about it, because she does it. And I watched <laughs> the whole Netflix series about it. Like it's really <laughs> difficult to know what it means. In other words, so sometimes when people write these things, we don't even believe you. We're like, look, so much happens here. You're going to learn so much. Do not focus very much on convincing us you know what you want to do four and a half years from the time that you're submitting that application. So you have to you have to stay away from focusing so much on what happens next. Um, another thing that's important uh, in terms of standing out is you, 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 you've commented on this. It's not an easy process. We know that. Particularly when people are applying to multiple schools. Um, there's so much information, so many different websites. We know you're getting bombarded with emails and all that. So I'm, it's not easy. But ensuring that you really are familiar with the program that you're talking about really matters. And I'll give you I'll just one ex important example why. Um, there's so much academic terminology. And, you know, I, I went to a, a great high school at a great college advisor, but even then I didn't understand. I didn't know what major college school concentration, but that's a minor. What's a dean? What in the <laughs> world is a provost? I, it's so much, there's so much about academic terminology that's very confusing. But if you're, if we're having a blunt discussion about, well, if they're all have good records and stuff, what are some ways to stand out? So here's an example of why sometimes my mind goes to what not to do. You don't want to, you, you want to do your, you want to do as you want to be very careful in making sure you truly understand a program and what that's how you, it's one of the ways to stand out. It's also one of the ways to prevent from being knocked down in the pool. And it's not because we're, Oh, so hoity toity and critical. It, it's for a really important reason. If in this battle to try to investigate and find a good fit and successfully apply to five, 10, 20 different programs, if you confuse some of the terms, if you confuse some of the structures, it may convince a committee that you may not have actually done sufficient research. Hmm. Um, an example would be if you're applying, you, Cornell's a good example. Um, uh, my particular school, and an, uh, there's only one major. You can't double major. Um, you can in some other programs. If you're writing a really good essay and you have a great record and all that, but you get certain components about the structure wrong, you call a school a college, you talk about your excitement about double majoring. We're not doing it because we are we don't need you. We have too many better people. We want you to be happy here. We, we really want this program right, to be right. what you want out of it. And so when certain things like that are wrong, we're actually worried that, wait a minute, 
Do you actually get what your opportunities are here? Do you actually get you don't have the flexibility that you think you do? That can knock you down in a pool. We don't want you to show. We don't have to have to call you and go, hey, we admitted you, but um, or or let's think realistically. If we get tens of thousands of application, how many schools are going to call up and go, hey, we just wanted to check. You know, you can't double major, right? <laughs> so that stuff can right. really matter. That when you're in a competitive pool, th- those things can really impact. It doesn't mean you're not going to be, comp- uh, you know, a top student, but but they are things that can impact the decision. Well, I think that's great advice. And it goes to doing your research and knowing what's available to you or not. And if you write something about wanting to double major and the school that they're applying to doesn't offer a double major, well, you didn't do your research and maybe... It's not the right fit, right, Ian? And I'll I'll get a little bit more specific about that. I, I, I again, I don't want people to freak out about this and all that. Uh, you know, about just <laughs> how much research you have to do. But I'm telling you, scour these websites, get on their lists, pay attention to everything that you're looking and on your lists that you keep, whether it's an Excel sheet or a Word document or something. Try to note all of these things; they can matter. And I'm I'm just going to use another example of. Um, sometimes, sometimes people will, um, they'll, they'll try to connect by, they'll, uh, we say this, um, call this a Google rule. Don't, don't try to connect with, uh, counselors and other schools may say against this. Sometimes, sometimes counselors say, oh, the, I know some people get advice where they say, show the school, the names of, tell, show the list, the names of the courses that interest you most. A lot of our programs, we don't like that at all. It's the, we call it the Google rule. Don't, don't put anything in your essay that just shows you can find the name of something. Right. Google's right. amazing. You can find the name of anything. Sure. So if, if we're, if we're continuing with this theme of marketing package, it's not about a good use of space. It's about the best use of space. The best use of space is not telling a school about itself. And through exciting classes like intro to conflict resolution and advanced dispute resolution, we know what we teach. We know what we teach. Don't tell us you did your research by telling us about ourselves. Show us. Show us by connecting with the issues, the topics you'll study in our program. The reason I mentioned that in the context of what we just discussed is sometimes people will just find the name of something and they miss the part where, man, that professor retired. I mean, he's emeritus. <laughs> he's not teaching anymore. Or, or they found the page for a certain institute, but that institute has been on, on hiatus while the professor. So, th- so nothing's been posted about that institute in three years. It's come. So sometimes, so sometimes they found something on the site. They write about it, but they miss that part. So again, making we want to make sure the student's happy, and we're like. They can't wait to do research with a professor that's retired for three years, you know, occasionally come back some, comes back and lectures. So we keep them on there. So again, it goes back to doing your research and putting your best foot forward in this uh, marketing yep. package that we've been talking about. How important are students' grades and courses in, in senior year of high school? And can you give an example of why a student's senior year performance made you change your mind regarding their admission status? Wow. Okay. So, so I will tell you to the last part, when, when you say admission status, you know, the first thing that jumps to mind for that is, uh, uh changing an admission status. If, if final senior year grades, uh, were drastically different than when we admitted someone, I mean, all, all, ex- all we use the, ex- the extreme example acceptances, acceptances are all contingent upon, you know, satisfactory performance in there. Um, so, so I can, this does not happen often, but if in a, there is a case where we admit someone who has very strong senior year grades, and then when we do the final uh, transcript check that we all do, we see a significant drop, that's a problem, per- particularly if we haven't heard from the student. Right. Life happens. Things right. can happen. We will always find out the context. Sure. So, so. So, so when you said that such that the status will change in that extreme example of the final grades after someone has been admitted, the only example I could think of is when in the handful of times across 16 years where we admitted a student, there was a significant drop in almost every class and there was no communication about it. And it was kind of hoping that we wouldn't, 
catch it. Um, but quickly, I will just say, if you're talking about you know that senior year schedule and maybe the quarter grades or midterm grades, I think I think to the idea, uh, I can't really think of too many examples where, to your question, status was changed. Right. They absolutely matter. We will look at them when submitted. Um, we do want to see that people continue to challenge themselves. If, if, to give a specific example of, okay, well, when can, when might it change a status? It, it can change a status if um, it gave us that additional information we needed, especially about a particular field. Uh, again, we are not people. People often think, oh, they're so they're selective. Their acceptance rate is so small. I got uh, I got a B minus once. I got a C once. Why would I even bother applying? We're not machines, man. We're not, uh, <laughs> you know, context matters. We not just because it not, and I'm not even saying that because it's about, oh, the only people who can get into Cornell are if you did drop in grades, you had some trauma. No, we spend the time reading it because you're a person and, and people learn in different ways. And, and that maybe sophomore year or junior year, you dropped in one class. It does not follow that you can't succeed in our program. So that's a place where senior year grades and the course selection could matter. Um, if we see a blip, say, in an area core to our field, but then we see the rest of the record is fine. And oh, by the way, they're still crushing it senior year. It, it gives us that permission to, to more comfortably go, yeah, they can do the work. Fantastic. And again, thank you for that insight. So I recently was chatting with a parent and I mentioned that I was going to have this interview and I asked, what would you want to know from Cornell University? And her answer surprised me. She said, what I really want to know is about the social life for students. What do students do socially on campus, whether it be after class is over during the week or on the weekend? She was really more interested to know about just the overall social life. So any insight, Ian, that you could give us on that yeah. would be greatly appreciated. Well, so I have kind of just two things that I will respond, that I typically respond to questions like that. The first is, you know, to my earlier point, whether we're talking about what's social life like, what's academic life like, what's the university like, to me, it all comes back to that notion of that is an important thing that the student needs to think about in terms of if the school is right for them. Uh, social life is a great example of that, uh, or anything kind of having to do with outside the classroom, right? We're in Ithaca, New York. We're in central New York. We're not New York City, right? This is a right. rural area. Right. Uh, it's gorgeous. And outdoor activities are popular, hiking, biking, you know, uh, skiing, right? We're right sure. by Cayuga Lake, which is stunning, all that stuff. But we're not a major city. So sometimes when people ask about social life, um, what they may be thinking of is, you know, again, we, we, when, when, you're, when your peer institutions are in Cambridge and in New York City, it's like, um, we get that question. And sometimes it's, it's sometimes for some people, it's about like, is there any up there? Like when I'm also, when I'm also looking at New York and museums, you know, <laughs> 20,000 different opportunities. What is there to compare there? Um, so that's where that's where I, I always have to emphasize that if someone's looking for that type of environment, um, specifically a city, a huge city social environment, the, hey, I want 15,000 things that have nothing to do with the university that I can totally detach because it's, uh, it's a New York or a San Francisco. Well, that's not us. <laughs> we're in Ithaca, New York. It's a, it's a small community of about 30,000 people plus around another 30,000 or so when all the schools are in session. That's not us. Now, there is way more to do than you will ever have time for. So that's the <laughs> other part of this um, socially, uh, whether, it, whether we're talking socially, academically, culturally, activities, that's the other thing to keep in mind is this is a, uh, it's a college town. Uh, education is the main economic driver here. There are multiple colleges that are the main areas of employment and main economic drivers are community. So I mentioned that because whether we're talking about social opportunities or academic opportunities, 
Um, yeah, you have different things in big cities. Great. That's one thing to experience. What I can tell you is that in a smaller community, there are opportunities for some pretty unique social experiences. And by that, I mean the colleges define the town. Uh, when we say to people, hey, why don't you go downtown and, and maybe go to some festivals with some friends, we're talking about the fact that students are heavily engaged in our community. Uh, so students are the volunteers who allow us to host the Chili Festival last weekend, the Apple Festival, <laughs> the Ice Carving Festival, Ithaca Festival. Um, when we say to students, "Oh, are you passionate about? Are you passionate about politics? Do you want to get involved?" Well, yeah. There's a New York City or a larger city, right, that may have all these opportunities. Here, it's tough to distinguish the students from the city. And a, a, a junior in my school just got elected to Common Council. Wow. Um, our mayor, uh, our, well, our, our our recent mayor, he just stepped down. Our mayor was elected at 24. Wow. He was a Cornell alum who got elected while in office. So, so here, when we talk about academic involvement and social involvement, there's a lot to do. Um, in particular, there are a lot of substantive ways to get very involved in these social and extracurricular things because of what a big part of our city, uh, the colleges are. Well, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. And I do hope that parent is listening uh, because she asked about the social life. So I really appreciate that, Ian. And, Again. and you know, I know we're going along. I'll just tell you very quickly, the other thing that I think we have to speak bluntly about, about the social thing is... Sure. It's college. Right. It, it's college. It's right. there's, there's some type of distribution. Um, I, I, went to, I went in this town to Ithaca College, which is much smaller at Cornell, and I found a distribution. Uh, so whether you go to a small school or a large university or you're in a large city or a small city, uh, here again, I say the onus is on the student. You'll be able to find the social life you want. There's going to be a just, there's going to be people who just aren't social at all and <laughs> academics and, and jobs are their life. Right. There's going to be the other right. end that you're like, do you guys ever go to class or how is it you keep doing so well in your grades? You bear, I don't, you don't go to class. And then there's the large middle. Right. So to me, the, the real answer to the social life thing is wherever you go, find your people. They'll be there. <laughs> That's great advice, Ian. Thank you so much. So to wrap up, Ian, lastly, my last question, what are the three top pieces of advice you would offer prospective students and their parents who are starting the process now? Uh, top piece of advice, which is to the students, but it's sort of a warning to the parents is step, step one is know yourself. And, uh, and, and I know that's a big catch all, but, but it really is about, um, you have to, this process is about asking some uncomfortably honest questions of yourself, uh, to my earlier comment about what people say about jobs, right? They go, I want to do this. I want to be a lawyer. Why? Why do you believe what you believe? What do you, it's okay. It's okay. I guess this real, I guess I'm realized this also connects to where we saying you're not done yet, right? You don't have to appear like you're some right. finished right. leader ready to go change society, even though you may be changing it now in other ways, there's still learning to do. So, so know yourself means you have to be very honest with yourself about what you do and don't like and why. Re really? Are, are you are you ruling out STEM? Do you really not like STEM, or did you not connect with that teacher, or did you get crushed on that Regents exam and it's haunted you? But you might; those things matter. Um, if are you pursuing a major or a or or a profession or some particular college because your parents wouldn't shut up about it? Or because you've been caught up in the zeitgeist of rankings and and tier one schools or some or everyone else around you is applying to this. What do and don't you know about yourself? Why do you believe what you believe? What do you actually look if you're I, 
Do you know what a do you know what a dean is? Do you know what a curriculum is? Or or like when you're looking on that website and it says distribution requirements, what does that actually mean? It's okay to not know. And I I vent about this because I um. This is very personal to me because on paper, I was not a first generation college student. We use those, we use labels and stuff like that a lot sometimes when we talk about it. But I effectively was what's considered, sometimes you go, well, first gen students, they may not be as savvy or familiar about these things. I wasn't first gen. I didn't know so much about that. I didn't know what I shouldn't know. So I was, I consider myself effectively a first gen. I didn't know these things. It's okay to ask. It's okay to ask what a major actually means, what, how a curriculum plays out. It's okay to ask when you call a particular school, is this major right for me? Our, our job is not to communicate with you when you've already decided you have to give off a great impression because you want to get in. Our job is to help you navigate this. Uh, and, a lot, and a lot of that starts with just knowing yourself and for parents, letting Letting your kids be honest about what they do and don't know. The second one's quick, which is we already touched on it. Know the program. You got to know yourself and you got to know the program. Um, you got to really dive in. And what do the terms mean? The structure? What flexibility do you actually have? Are you writing about things that are currently active and still exist? Um, Cornell is a good example. If you know that the particular committee at Cornell is the one that has to admit you, do not spend 50% of your supplement essay writing about the clubs at Cornell, which are mostly open to everyone, or writing about how excited you are to be in Ithaca, New York. Don't spend half of it writing about things you'd be able to do in any college or school. They don't want to hear that. They want to know why you want to be in their program. And and then the last one, just a, uh, I guess a third. You said three, three top. <laughs> you you could that three. You could go more if you want. Ian. <laughs> I, I can go two more hours. But if you ask me about three top, th there's two kind of general ones which encompass a lot. Know yourself. Know your program. No, know the program. I guess the last piece is. Um, I guess this is general. This is general application advice, right, for a job or like that. Uh, this can be a charged process, an emotional process. This can be a sensitive process. Find a way to include someone who you don't know and who doesn't know you. And you might not even talk to them. Um, this is my way of saying, and I'm mainly talking about essays. However you go about doing it, whether it's uh, some people I know I've, I've I've talked about this. They've gotten a friend to ask another friend, and they take their name off the essays, or ask a parent to ask one of their friends. Uh, my point is, it can be very helpful to have your essays reviewed by someone who does not care about your feelings at all. Right. Right. When you're sitting in front of your family member and asking them what they think or sitting in front of the English <laughs> teacher who can be helpful with the, with the grammar aspects of it, that's great. But wow, I, I have the people who do this, it's not a lot, but the ones who do this go, whoa, that was helpful. When they don't know you and are not concerned about how you will react and if you just hand them those two essays and, say, and, and, and get that feedback, say to them, ask someone who doesn't even know it's from you to read it and go, what are your two main takeaways? So, so just to give an example, if they come back from, say, the supplement essay and they have no idea what you're interested in, that's a problem. And you need someone to tell that to. You may even ask them, like, tell me what I'm going to study. If they can't do it, you got to go back to it. And I just, this can be a really charged process. And I find it very valuable to uh, somehow work in a harsh editor. That is tremendous advice. And it goes to the theme of the whole conversation, which happens to be connections along with many other themes, but the connections, definitely knowing yourself, knowing the program and having the courage to include someone that doesn't know you to help review your essay and to be humble enough to take that feedback and make sure that you present yourself the best that you can in this thing that we call the marketing package, right? That's what, the way we refer to it. Ian, 
this was an amazing conversation. I Oh, thanks. I I truly cannot thank you enough on behalf of the podcast, but more importantly, the students and the parents that are going to be listening. Thank you so much for your time today. We truly appreciate it, Ian. Thanks so much, Sean. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the CAP, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the CAP. What's up, podcast friends? I'm happy to share that we've teamed up with Dormco to make your dorm decorating a lot easier. Why Dormco? They offer quality and durability, affordability, and a wide selection for bedding to storage solutions and everything in between for your dorm room. So if you or anyone you know is looking to decorate your dorm, see the affiliate partnership link in the show notes for Dormco, your one stop for stylish, affordable, and quality dorm essentials. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission, but rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes.